like we've heard from our hero in the past, the gringo loco moves on to a new location and falls into the same old tricks. But as you'll soon find, he quickly becomes as big or bigger than he's ever been. And what does that mean? The consequences may be even larger than ever. So let's see how he brings the mafia together with the cartels and the trouble that ensues. Enjoy this episode. At the end, I'll talk to you a little bit more about where we're going and the uh, interviews I've got lined up. It's pretty exciting stuff. I'm looking forward to sharing more and more about Sean with you guys, our gringo loco, as I've been able to peel the onion back more and more. So enjoy this one. It's a short one, but it's action-packed. See you at the end. Leaving Sausalito, no longer wanted there, I went back to San Francisco. I had a friend that was willing to rent me a room in his house. I was good to be back in the city. I had enough of Marin County. Once again, I had a fresh new start in a different place. Always keeping one step ahead ahead always keeping them guessing where I was like a chess game thinking a few moves ahead this was a way of life for me as I had many years earlier before actually starting here at the age of 15 years old being not only introduced to Frank Sinatra but also being inducted into the Italian Mafia. One of the youngest in history ever to do so, I might add. Once again, I found myself where it got started with the meat man and the bread man from the family. I was to once again dominate San Francisco with the green white and glass the music sports show business art industry as well as the biggest gangs were my clients disguising product in meat bread cereal boxes candy potato chip bags cows chickens fish etc Distribution was done on a daily basis. I found myself busy all the time, every day. I was so up the ladder, working as direct as anyone could be in this business, in the planet. The mafia told me it was time that I had my own bodyguard. I told the Italian family that I wanted one from the Mexican cartel. With all due respect, this was unheard of within the family and never done before. I told the meat man he has been a friend of mine for many years and cities included doing business with me and he was my bodyguard and roommate before I trust him with my life. I would never jeopardize the family in any way. I stake my life on it. Dean Mayo in the Mexican cartel would be the first to somewhat work for the Italian mafia, maintaining his relationship with the cartel. It was two for one for both sides. As for a long time, working with Pablo Escobar, El Chapo, getting our supplies direct from the source. The shipments were coming from Arizona into California. This was before the tunnels. Transportation was done by trucks, cars, etc. I was to pick up a load using a -a rent-a-car. Dean and I took a lot of money from San Francisco to Arizona. 
pick up the stuff, put it in the spare tire in the trunk, make one drop off, pick up $100,000 right on the California Nevada border. Then come back to San Francisco, give the meat man the money and the kilos from Chapo's man. Myself never working direct with him or even seeing him, nobody did. He had a lot of people working for him. The Ochoa brothers no longer in the picture. Chapo had expanded his territory from Mexico to the United States of America. The closest to California for above the border was Nevada and below the state was Baja California, Tijuana, on the border of Mexico and California. I managed with Dean in the rental car something that I would later regret for the rest of my life. Many times before with shipments of product, not a problem. We found ourselves after the hard part of receiving delivery in Arizona, making it across the border into California, making the drop off with a client, picked up the $100,000 in cash. We had the money and kilos stashed in the spare tire in the trunk of the rent a car. All we had to do was fill up the tank with gas and go home. I remember being so tired in the gas station as I had been driving the whole time. The distance had taken its toll on me. So I asked Dean, who was filling the tank up with gas at the time, to please drive. He put the pedal to the metal punching it with his foot to the floor on the gas, making a burnout as the wheels spun out of control, making skid marks from the gas station to the street. I yelled at him, what the hell are you doing? I don't want to draw any attention to us. Do I need to remind you what we're carrying? It's a lot of stuff. We have kilos of coke, weed, and money, $100,000 in cash. Slow down. It wasn't a second after that we heard the police sirens and saw the red and blue flashing lights behind us. With the California Highway Patrol, as they were just finished eating at the restaurant in front of the gas station, Neither one of us seeing them, being so tired and not focused on the job. This was a nightmare that was now my reality. Pull over is what we heard from the police loudspeaker, only to have a local sheriff patrol car pull in front of us, boxing us in on the side of the road. What bad luck for us, it was a K-9 unit. As the police and CHP got out of their cars to approach us, the sheriff's dog was barking. They had their weapons drawn, telling us to show our hands and put them up in the air, then to slowly get out of the car. Dean told me before getting out of the car to say nothing. You don't know anything. You're just a hitchhiker from the gas station. As we were told to face the car and first told to put our left hands behind our backs, then right, the police handcuffed us. I asked them why. They said, why are you in such a hurry, speeding out of the gas station like that? Did you see us? 
Do you have anything to hide? Why are you so nervous? I told them under gunpoint. I'm in handcuffs with your dog barking in my face. I was told as a matter of fact, the dogs and I are going to check your car. Do you have any objections to that? I replied, no officer, I'm just a hitchhiker. As you saw, I wasn't even driving. Dean right away replied, that's right. I just picked him up. Gentlemen, I'm going to search your car. Do you have anything to say to me before I do? No, officer, we both replied at the same time. Obviously thinking to ourselves, hell no, don't check the car. But that's an instant guilty sign. As the CHP checked the inside of the car, he said it was clean, nothing. The sheriff said, keep an eye on these two while I check the trunk. The dog keeps looking back there and smells something. As the sheriff opened it up, he also said, there's nothing but a spare tire. The dog at the time was barking profusely, couldn't stop. It wanted that tire. As it jumped in the back of the trunk, it was smelling the tire. The policeman told his dog to sit on the street. The sheriff then took the tire out of the car and put it next to the K-9, then proceeded to take off the tire from the rim. There, everything was exposed kilos of coke and high-grade marijuana, also $100,000. The California Highway Patrol and the local sheriff told us both that we were under arrest, cuffed and stuffed in the CHP car and escorted by the sheriff, having no room in his car because of the dog. We had just passed the border of Nevada into California, into a small town called Gonzales, in the middle of nowhere. We were to be taken to the closest facilities. Unlucky for us, the, there was the notorious prison, top 10, that's for sure called Sing Sing, each thrown into separate holding cells, only to be instantly interrogated. They asked me to tell my part of the story. I told them that I was just a hitchhiker and I didn't know anything. He told me that I was in a lot of trouble and looking at serious time. I told him I was just at the wrong place at the wrong time. It's the story of my life. He told me, shut up, be quiet, and I'm going to talk to your accomplice and see what he has to say about this. Not being able to hear the conversation between the two of them, I was very nervous that I wasn't already scared shitless, trapped in this nightmare only to have the policeman come back and tell me that Dean said I was a hitchhiker and didn't know anything. The sheriff was so mad, yelling at me. I don't believe it. How are you going to let your friend take the rap for this? I was thinking the same thing to myself. He's looking at five years at least. I was held under charges of suspicion. This meant that even though Dean had admitted to being guilty to the charges, the judicial system wanted to get me too. After a period of time, locked up once again in an orange jumpsuit, 
behind bars in prison. I was later found innocent of all charges, whereas my friend was not so lucky. He was charged guilty and had to spend seven years in prison, depending on good behavior, which meant if he was a good inmate, he could be released in four to five years. That's what Dean was looking at for his horrible mistake at the gas station. But nonetheless, what a good gesture on his behalf, not only to take the rap, but keep his mouth shut about the Mexican cartel and the Italian mafia. Dean never said a word about me to the police and the judge, always claiming I was just a hitchhiker and knew nothing. I was impressed as well as the cartel and mafia. Upon release, I was picked up by the meat man, a policeman also with the Mafia. I thought at that moment, upon finally being released from jail, like that wasn't enough. But now, I was, it was even worse. I was going to be dead for sure. How's that for a cliffhanger? I remember being really eager and nervous for him, but eager to hear the next tape. Uh, It's really, really exciting stuff as as this goes on. So the stakes got higher, the consequences are bigger, and uh, (laughs) the meat man's back in the picture. Uh, So we'll see. Keep listening week by week for, for more about what happens next. In the meantime, I've managed to find more people that were in Sean's life when uh, I knew him and continue to be in his life in some cases, or at least they claim to be. So I'm lining up some interviews to get a better idea of, of who the man is and who he's become. So I look forward to sharing that with you as well. I'm still crossing my fingers. Sean's out there somewhere. Um, we'll, we'll catch up to him. We'll catch up to him. I, I really believe it. I mean, I, we, were, we weren't super close, but we were friends and we knew each other. So I'll find him and, and we'll, we'll see what we can do with that. Okay, so please, uh, now we're on Spotify and uh, iTunes at Gringo Loco Pod. So please uh, follow us, like us, download us. It really helps. Uh, We want to get this story out there. It's pretty fantastic stuff. So uh, be back next week for episode nine. Thanks for listening to True Story, a podcast by Gringo Loco. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube page at Sean Balin Gringo Loco Podcast and follow us on Instagram at Gringo Loco Pod. Catch our next episode one week from today.